Thanks for having me here today. Appreciate it. I promise not to be too liberal. <laughs> uh, I want to I talk about Georgia taxes. Um, I want to start by asking a question, what's wrong? Because, because lots of people think lots is wrong. What's wrong? And then I want to give a kind of a profile of where we are in Georgia because there's a lot of misinformation that gets passed around about what kind of state we are and how we compare relative to the rest of the country. And then I want to do a brief review of the system with you and discuss what's wrong, what went on at the last session, what else was on the table, what opportunities were passed and should have been passed. And then finally, uh, I'd like to make a couple of comments. One on the issue of, of the of part of your conference, which is whether expenditures are out of control, uh, and the other on the, the kind of coming agenda for Georgia. So I'll go real fast, okay. Uh, I have some overlays um, with some data. But let me, let me start with, with the, before we start to look at the data, with, with this issue of what's wrong with Georgia taxes. Well, you, you know, there's no such thing as a proper tax system. There's no model or no ideal. It depends. It depends on what the objectives are that the state wants to achieve and what it wants to wait. I mean, that's why legislatures make decisions. It's a political decision. Now, what we can do as analysts, and that's kind of what we are, whether we're academics or in the business community, is we can ask the question about what criteria we'd like, we'd like to consider and how we'd like to weight those. And most places, you come down with four or five things. One of them is the issue of vertical equity. How does your tax system treat people who are rich, middle class, and poor? And you, and you sort of have to work it out in terms of who really pays the tax. And uh, our version of the story in Georgia, after what we hope is a lot of careful work, is that it's about progressive. That people, most people, pay about the same percent of their income in tax. There are some at the very, very bottom who are a little different and at the very, very top who are a little different. But by and large, the system is about, is about proportional. Um, that's a little better than most states in this country if you're inclined to think tax systems ought to be more progressive. Most states in this country have systems that are relatively regressive. So that comparatively is not at the top of the list of Georgia's problems. There is the issue of economic development in this state. Um, we are very, very hospitable to investment with our tax system. We have relatively low taxes, we have relatively low taxes, and we have low taxes that bear heavily on capital. We have one of the lowest uh, corporate income taxes in the country. Um, first speaker today said that one of the things he, he, he could live with on the income tax is a flat tax. He, he's probably happy in Georgia because that's <coughs> basically what we have, a flat tax. We get people in early, we get them to that 6% rate, and there they, there they stay, and there's no progression beyond that. Um, and we have a very liberal incentives program. Um, much too liberal for my taste, um, but lots of incentive to create jobs and lots of tax return for companies that do. So really hospitable. Um, uh, do we have a problem with high taxes and a rapid growth in taxes? And the answer is no. We have, I'll show you. We have low taxes compared to the rest of the country. We're about 10 percent below the average state in the country. We don't have high taxes by any stretch of the imagination. Are they growing fast? Well, uh, as a share of personal income, we're about where we were in the mid-1970s. So is that rapid growth? Do you think taxes are growing very fast? Uh, we've gone through a cycle in this country after Proposition 13 that some of the old guys in the room will remember where state local taxes kind of bent down and then they came back up. But we're about back to the pre, we're, we're, we're around the pre-Prop 13 level. So those aren't the problems. What's wrong? Well, there are some things wrong. One thing is, is, is the issue of, of horizontal equity, we call it, or fairness in the tax system. The tax system doesn't treat everybody the same. Even people within the same income level aren't treated the same by the tax system because our economy changed and our tax system didn't. Number one problem, that's what we're going to talk about. And the other is, is really back to this issue of growth. You know, this concern, uh, our expenditures growing too fast, is one thing. 
Another concern is, is the tax system responding adequately to cover your normal increase in costs? If that tax system is growing relatively slow, then you force your legislature to go in and make up things every session. And when the legislature is making up reforms instead of getting automatic increase in the tax system, then you're going to get in trouble because it's going to be driven too much by politics and too little by what a tax system ought to be. Um, now, um, so, so the message is we need to plan and we need to somehow adjust to the changing economy and we need to think more broadly. Just because we haven't done something in the past doesn't mean we ought not to do it in the in the future. The tax system of the next decade is going to look very different from the tax system of the past decade. Um, let's look at the first, let's talk about the profile of Georgia. Let's look at the first. This is Georgia in the United States, 1992. That's unfortunately the latest year for which you can get all state and local government aggregates. On average, that 9.8 percent in total tax revenue means that of every hundred dollars in income earned on average $9.80 is paid in taxes. In the rest of the country, $10.80. We're about 10 percent below the national average. Is that state and local? Yes, ma'am, state and local. And you have to compare state and local because states do things in such different ways that you have to add them together. Um, now, it doesn't mean that every tax is low. We're a low property taxing state. We were low before the latest set of reductions. We always have been a low property taxing state. Um, because we're low on the property tax, we're a little heavier on the sales tax and on the individual income tax. You may ask, how can we be higher on the individual income tax when our rates, our top end rates, are low relative to other states? Well, four states don't have an income tax. They're included in here. And a few states have pretty anemic income taxes, like Tennessee, which only does dividends and interest. Uh, and we, start, we, ca we catch people early. You get into our income tax system very, very early at about 16000 That's low compared to the rest of the country. But on the corporate tax, it's low. And on other taxes, it's low. And that's very heavily influenced by gasoline taxes, where we rank 49th out of the 50 states. We're one of the, we have one of the lowest gasoline taxes in the United States. So a moral there, a story there, a low taxing state. I, I would love to hear somebody say something different. At the bottom, um, question, do we, uh, do we live off the federal dole more than most states? Well, we get about $595 per capita in federal grants, and on average in the 50 states, it's 682. So we get less. Uh, we get less than the rest of the country, and we're, that means we're less reliant. Uh, are we a heavy borrower? Uh, you can see if you take uh, general obligation debt as a share of personal income, we're, we're a couple of percent below the rest of the country in terms of the claim on our income of debt. So if we're low borrower and we're low in terms of the federal money we receive and if we're low in terms of taxes, then you know what the next slide is going to show is that our spending levels are low. Have to be. Um, on a per capita basis, state and local governments in Georgia spend $3,300. In the average state, they spend $3,800. We, uh, state and local government employment per 10,000 population, if you just compare all the states, for every 10,000 people, we have 588 state and local government employees. In the rest of the country, it's 524. So we use more people. Uh, a lot of reasons for that. You know, we have a lot of local governments out there, and a lot of it, there's a lot of duplication that goes on when you have that. And there's surely some kind of an efficiency story to be told. But we employ a lot of people. But it's okay because we pay them about 22% less on average than the average worker makes in the United States. So the payroll of state and local governments in Georgia as a share of income is pretty much the same as it is in the rest of the country. So. We aren't a big spender state. Uh, and if you go through function by function, you find that we rank near the bottom. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't plenty wrong and plenty to talk about in terms of the efficiency of government spending. But it's really hard to make the case that you have a legislature run amok in terms of the amount of its income that it allocates to the public sector. Now, I want to comment on, on um, I want to comment on 
what's wrong with Georgia taxes and where we are. And my basic point to, to you today is that the problem isn't that we did anything wrong in our tax system. It's just that we haven't changed it. It's actually not too bad, and it served the state well for a long time. But this economy has changed so much in the last two decades that the tax system doesn't fit the economy. And so what we go after with the tax system isn't really where we generate our income and where we spend our money and where we have our property wealth. And that's, that's what went wrong. I think the first, the next picture, yeah. This basically shows how you spend, how you spend your money. For, 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 for old guys like me in the room, think about how your parents spent their money and think about how you spend your money. And there have been huge differences. You used to buy uh, goods and services, and now you, you buy much more services and much less goods than you did before. If you just look at the number for medical, the medical share growing from 11.8 to 15.9 over a period as short as 13 years, you know, that's a, that's a huge difference. Even that little 4% deal is a huge difference. Housing is about the same. Food has gone down. Um, if you look at that category, other, it's other plus um, uh, other includes uh, goods and services and food we tax. We tax part of other. We tax clothing. We don't tax housing. We don't tax medical. We don't tax much of transportation. And we don't tax um, much of recreation services. And so by our count, the share of the dollar that you pay in sales taxes has fallen from somewhere around half to somewhere closer to 40 percent. So what's happening is that sales tax base is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and getting smaller just because people consume in different ways. But we never thought about taxing services. Services is, a, is, is something that in, has been kind of sacred and it's been kind of left out. But it creates an unfairness in the system. If these consumption patterns change and you don't tax services, suppose you buy a pair of shoes, you pay tax, and you buy a toaster, and you pay tax. And he gets his taxes prepared by an accountant, and he doesn't pay any tax. And he gets a divorce, and he doesn't have to pay any tax because he, he chose to spend his money in a different way. That's just plain old not fair. And if you look at the list of services that are outside the system, you could convince yourself of that. What we have to get ready for on the services side is one of two things. Either we have to include them in the base and keep the rate down or get ready for 9 or 10 percent rates. Because if we continue to tax this shrinking share of consumption, we're going to have to do it with a much higher rate. That's the first point. Um, it's not just on the, on the consumption side, it's on the production side. The next little picture we have shows how Earnings are distributed by industry. I hope you can see that. I, the, if you look at 19, the 1970 number for Georgia, and just kind of run your eye down, you see manufacturing, 25% of all earnings were generated in the manufacturing sector. And you just keep going on down. And look at services, about 14%. Um, and then just look at how services gradually crept up over time in terms of the share of earnings that was in the service sector. And th that's that sector that we're not reaching uh, so completely with the tax system. So the economy has changed. The, the tax system hasn't, hasn't caught up with it. And we're going to have to think a completely different way about how we tax, because we've got an unfairness in, in the system. Um, they're sacred cows. Um, the age distribution in our state is changing. If I was a politician, I couldn't tell this story, but I'm not a politician, so I can tell this story. The age distribution in our, our state is changing. Just take a look at Georgia in 1970, and let me call your attention to the top two, bottom two rows, people over 65. Look at that, 6% plus 3%, that's 9.8% 9, 9 of the state population was over 65 in 1970, and then 12.6% in 1992, 12.6% uh, of a larger base, right, in 1992, and it's going to be even larger than that 10 years from now. So the elderly are a growing share of our state population, and they're going to be an even greater growing share. Now, 
you know, if in your mind, and, and, and how should the tax system treat the elderly? We treat them very well. We exempt the first 14,000 of their income, no matter where they get it from. I mean, they're, they receive preferential treatment on the property tax. Uh, and, if, and, and, and let our stereotype run toward, toward your grandmother living on fixed income uh, in a small house and trying to make it, and that's the way it ought to be. But all of these baby boomers that are coming to retirement, and a lot of them that are already here, are pretty well healed. And they came in with all kinds of retirement systems and substantial amounts of capital income. And it's going to be even more so in the future. And if you don't means test tax relief to the elderly, then the rest of the population, including the business sector, is going to have to pay a much larger chunk in order to accommodate that. That's a very, very big problem. But, you know, as the guys in Florida will tell you, politically, the clout of the elderly is very strong. And if you don't get this tax treatment of the elderly right now so that you means test it for their income level, you pay a price later on. Um, it's also a question of uh, where we earn our income. That's really different. I want you to look at, this, this is how income is divided up amongst sources. I want you to look at wages and salary. See the middle bracket? And I want you to look at Georgia. See Georgia um, in 1970, 67.6, about two-thirds percent of all income was earned from wages and salaries, the regular old earnings that we always thought of as being most of income. Well, it was only two-thirds then, but it's 58.5% in 1992. That's a, big, that's a big change. Where was the growth? Um, well, look back over just one bracket to the left to transfer payments. And you could see that transfer payments increased from 9.3% of total income to 13.9%. Transfer payments are mostly medical assistance. Also includes public assistance and welfare. Think about it. That stuff is largely outside the tax system. So we have a growing share of our income in this transfer payments that we, we, don't, we don't treat in the, in the tax system. Food stamps, by federal law, are not subject to sales tax and ought not to be subject to sales tax in my view. Medical assistance payments aren't reached. We don't reach it in terms of the recipient. We don't reach it in terms of the, the vendor. So we have a growing share of where we earn our income uh, out, outside the system. You also see a growth in capital income, that share that's earned from dividends, interest, rents, and royalties. And that's part of this retirement story that we're going to see more of. And then finally, Look at this. What happened to the low end of the income distribution in Georgia over this period of time? This is a percent of families. Look at the 1969 number for Georgia of 20.7, right? See that 20.7 number for Georgia? That's the percent of family. Yeah, there it is. That's the percent of families in Georgia uh, who had incomes below the poverty line in 1969 versus right above it, 13% for the United States. We have a heavier concentration of the poor. If you run out to 1990, we still have a heavier concentration of the poor. 15% of the people in Georgia below the poverty line. But, uh, but, we, but we've gained ground on the rest of the country. So while we focus on this notion of the number of poor people, and, and we ought to do that, uh, we've gained ground on the rest of the country, but we still have a high concentration of the poor. These people are outside the system of the tax system, and ought to be. But one of the things we need to think about is because our income tax floor is so low, we bring people in so fast that the floor on our income taxes is kind of close to the poverty line, probably closer than fairness would dictate that it ought to be. And as you know, in the legislature this time, one of the bills that they argued very seriously was one that would lift the standard deduction and personal exempt, exemption level. Um, okay, what, what, um, what story does this tell us about uh, big issues that are coming? Well, I, I think there are three big issues for um, taxation in Georgia that are going to continue to be debated. The first one is the property tax. It's what we did this time. There was an across-the-board property tax relief. This is a tough issue. We're not a high property taxing state relative to the rest of the country. But, but that's not what's important in choosing tax structure. What's important is what people want. People don't like the property tax. 
You know they're, they're either in the process of rolling it back or debating a rollback in 24 states during the sessions that are underway right now. Why don't people like this tax? I mean, look, there's some good things about it. It's deductible from your federal income tax liability if you're an upper income itemizer. It's probably not a regressive tax. It's pretty stable over the business cycle. It doesn't bounce around. Kind of can tie it to school benefits uh, if it's primarily a school tax. And it kind of balances your system. You know, states that don't have one of the three sales income or property taxes have to have high rates on the other. Alabama, for all practical purposes, doesn't have a property tax. But around Birmingham, they've got sales tax in the 9 and 10 percent rates. So, so why don't people like this property tax? Well, it's, they, don't, they, don't, they don't like somebody taxing your property, for one thing. And it's a tax on accrued wealth. Um, just because the value of your property went up doesn't mean you have any more money in your pocket, yet they want to tax it away with a property tax. And also, if my income tax, I make $100, somebody takes out X percent, you know, and then they give me the rest. Or if I go buy a pair of shoes for 50 bucks, then I paid my 6 percent on top of that, and I know what it is, but the property tax, some character you know, kind of wanders around outside your, your house at best, and then you get a letter in the mail telling you how much your tax is. And people don't like that kind of judgmental stuff. So they don't like this property tax anywhere. So there's going to be more movement to reduce the property tax. And anyway, it is a world-class bad way to finance public education. And in this state, we're, we're going to find out ourselves that we can't do it. And if we don't, the courts are probably going to tell us in the next few years. Uh, we're going to have some more action on the income tax floor, that standard deduction personal exemption level. I think that um, a sensible thing to do would be to get rid of the corporate income tax completely in Georgia. Uh, I would put that on the table as something to look at. With the new incentives program underway, they pretty much neutered the thing. It, it only yields a relatively small amount of money, and it might be kind of a real favorable thing to say for economic development purposes not to have it. We're going to fight the sales tax fight again. Uh, you've got to expand the tax base to include services. Um, there are, by our account, about 130 categories of services that are outside the system that need to be looked at. Um, the fight on food will come up over and over. It's a tough fight. Shall we, shall we exclude food from the sales tax? And, and here the appeal to you has to be, you know, think. You know, think about this thing. Don't just, don't just buy in blindly on one side or the other. Half the states exempt food, so there's got to be some real good reasons for exempting food. Half the states tax it. There must be some pretty good reasons for taxing it. Um, you know, when you take food out of the sales tax, boy, that thing gets really unstable and starts bouncing around the cycle. So that means that you've got to be prepared for much bigger swings in revenues over the business cycle when you get food out of it. Um, the big argument for the sales tax on food is that it make, it's more progressive, you know? I mean, that, it rings true, doesn't it? If I say to you, we all know poor people have to spend more money on food and a higher share of their income, and so if we take food out, somehow or another we're going to be benefiting low-income people. That, that, that sounds right, something we can all believe. Well, it sounds better than it is um, because at the very bottom end, you've got food stamps. And at the very bottom end, food stamps aren't subject to the sales tax. Now, as you start to move up the system, you know who spends more money on food. You know who'd go home with more money in their pocket if you took the sales tax off food. There's higher income people. That's where the relief would reside. And then when you needed to make up the revenues that you lost from that relief, you'd have to make them up by increasing the sales tax rate, and then you'd whop it to the people that spend their money for toasters and jeans and shoes. So I think you could, if you sit down and run the numbers, I think you can convince yourself that this is regressive as anything if you, if you move in that direction. So it's sort of well-intentioned thinking, um, but there's an argument. There are very strong arguments against it, and you, you just have to run, run the numbers yourself. Now, why would you want to do it? Well, why you'd want to do it is that if you're looking for broad-based tax relief, it's fair in the sense that it reaches everybody. You want everybody to get involved in the tax relief. Everybody buys food. So there's a strong argument for it there. 
uh, and half the states do it, and there's a strong argument for it there. And then there's just sort of some moral notion you ought not to go around taxing something like a person's food. Um, okay, so that's a, a big debate, and there's no right and there's no wrong about it. Um, it just depends on what it is you want to achieve and who you want to give the benefits to. Now, last thing I'll say. Um, uh, the future. Are expenditures out of control? I, I, I think it would be awfully hard to argue that expenditures are out of control in Georgia. We're one of the lowest spending states in the country uh, uh, across nearly all functions. Our payroll expenditures uh, are not high. Um, there has been a growth in spending, but it hasn't been a growth that's outstripped the level of, uh, of personal income. Uh, nor uh, has it been faster than the growth in other states. And should there have been a growth? Well, there's inflation, and, and, and Georgia's uh, expenditure uh, growth did go faster than inflation, but we've added, uh, in the last uh, 12 years, we've added 1.3 million people. The real average income of a Georgian went up $3,500 on average, the real income over that period. The real income of an American went up $2,500. So, a big difference. Think of the industry that's come and the infrastructure that had to be provided to support it. Think of how far behind we were in the first place and the kinds of things that we had to do to catch up. And you really have to factor all that in. Now you may still conclude, you know, that there's gross inefficiency in the government sector and that, and, and that because they don't have a profit test, you have a lot of people sort of standing around when they shouldn't be standing around. Fair enough. And maybe subsidy payments are out of line. Fair enough. But the the level of spending, uh, you, can't, you can't use that to support this story. Um, let me close with so something I think kind of interesting. Um, we did the Ohio tax reform. This, this, this is a story about uh, how states think of things differently. We live in Georgia, so we think about Georgia, and we read about, we, we, we read about all this stuff in the Journal Constitution, and that kind of tells us where we are, uh, and, and we focus on that. So we're in Ohio, and we're doing the Ohio tax reform, uh, and we worked up there for about a year, and so you had to get your mindset different. You had to think about where are we going in Ohio, right? Well, I got a picture about where we're going is where we're going with the Ohio economy. Now, on the left-hand side is just kind of an index number. I, I took Ohio, and I said, let's index them to the national average with an index of one in 1969. If they had six percent of the national income in 1969, I gave them an index number of one. And, and so those three lines show what happened to Ohio's relative level of population personal income and per capita personal income over the period 1969 to 1993. And that's really something, right? It means that they're losing their national share on virtually every indicator. The only thing that you can see that doesn't look so bad is way out 1991 to 1993, that top graph, their per capita personal income is going up. Uh, and that means that their, and the only reason that happened was because their uh, personal income share wasn't declining faster than their population share, and sort of a figment of the numerator and denominator. So it's a declining state. So what does a state like that have to say? That has to, they have to look down the road and say, we have to finance our public services to try to attract industry to a state where we have a decaying infrastructure, but we have to attract it with the prospects of a declining economic base and much less growth in taxation. Let me tell you, that is not exactly where you want to be in 1994 when you're competing in this international market that your keynote speaker talked about. Same graph for Georgia. That's where you want to be. Um, that's exactly where you want to be. Uh, same exact thing, and that's Georgia's share of income, population, and per capita income. And what we've had is, is, is remarkable growth. And because we've had remarkable growth, we've been able to hold the true tax rate, taxes as a share of, of personal income, in line for a relatively long period of time. And the questions we have to ask on the expenditure side are, do we need, are, are we at the right rate of infrastructure investment in order to sustain that kind of growth in the long run? Thank you.